Good evening. My name is Dr. Christopher Jimenez e. West. It is my honor to serve as one of the co-advisors for Black Student Assembly. I'd like my fellow advisors to stand up and be recognized. Where are you? If you're an advisor for Black Student Assembly, please stand up and be recognized. Lionel, Tamika, Arkova. <laughs> Um, I can be selfish, so I am. Um, about 20 years ago, I did my undergraduate work at the University of California at Berkeley um, in history. And my undergraduate thesis was on the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. I had the honor of interviewing Landon Williams, one of the captains of the party. And it was always clear to me that the most difficult interviews that I did were with former Panther members. And not difficult in the sense that they were tasking. They were difficult in the sense that these were men who put their lives on the line. And so their expectations were, particularly for a young black man, that if you were going to come, you needed to come correct. Um, I incorporated into my personal life, my personal email address for the last 20 years has been the number four Black Panther. Got me in a lot of trouble, and that's OK, <laughs> um, ironically. Um, But the most important thing that we do at Pasadena City College is that we educate students. And the most important thing that we do here in particular is to provide a space for students to be who they are supposed to be, to achieve and strive for greatness. And part of that is connected into giving them an opportunity to live, to exist, to grow, and to become great. The Black Student Assembly here at Pasadena City College, it has been my honor for the last two years to serve as his advisor. And for the last two years, there is a young man who has served in Black Student Assembly who's just been extraordinary. And for the last two years, he's been whispering, you know I got to, you know I got to. I was like, fine. Um, because he comes from a legacy from a young man, his father, who was recruited off this campus to be a Black Panther Party member. And he put this together. He helped to put together Black History Month, as he has for the last two years. Um, he's going to go off and do extraordinary things. Um, I am humbled and honored to introduce Robert Gordon. Hello, everybody. Uh, before we get started, I just want to ask that you guys please, 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 please put your phones on silent, put them on vibrate, be respectful. Uh, I just, is nothing worse than having, having a speaker and we're having to hear all the, all the noises. So please, if you get an opportunity, please take your phones out, put them on silent or put them on vibrate, please. Um, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about myself. So again, my name is, my name is Robert Gordon, coordinator for Black History Month. Um, Anyone who knows me knows that um, there's nobody, no one I look up to uh, more than my father. Um, I mean, I, I emulate his walk, I emulate his, his, his posture, how he stands. I steal his clothes every opportunity I get. Um, he, and he'll, he'll tell you about it every opportunity he gets. Um, and he's just, he's done, he's done an amazing, amazing job of, of raising me. Um, and I'll never forget, there was, there was a moment that I wasn't really exposed to, to what I, I would call now the real world uh, growing up until I was probably about 13, 14. I didn't know what the word racism meant um, because they, my, my parents did a good job of making sure I wasn't exposed to stuff like that. Um, and I, I'll, I'll never forget uh, one of my, one of my uh, faculty when I, was in, when I was in middle school came to me and said, oh, yeah, so you ever heard of the, you know, the Black Panther Party? I said, Black Panther? What, what the hell is that? Um, so I went home and I came to dad. I said, dad, what's the Black Panther Party? Is that like, you know, they get a bunch of Panthers together and they just, you know, kind of just run around and they have fun? Like, that don't sound like a fun party to me. He said, no. He said, no, son. That's, that's, that's not what a Black Panther Party is. Um, and so that's, that opened the door 
for him to kind of just tell me, tell me stories. I can't even, I'm not, I'm not technically allowed to repeat. Um, but he would, he would tell me these stories about, you know, his past and how young he was and, and just, just, just these amazing stories that just crafted him into the, into the exceptional gentleman that I know today and that I look up to. Um, there is a man who I'm going, um, I have the, the pleasure of welcoming and introducing today who my father looks up to. Um, and it's, it's been an honor to, to talk to him on the phone, to shake his hand, to talk to him, to, to greet him. Um, there's, I'm honestly, I'm at, I'm at a loss for words right now at the moment, but uh, if you guys give you a, a round of applause for Mr. Bobby Sue. Thank you. Thank you, the Black Student Unions and Black Student Organizations and others for inviting me here to Pasadena City College. Um, black History Month, as they put it, <laughs> you know, still rolls on. About four years ago, I spoke at or Orlando or Seminole University in Orlando, Florida. And uh, the tea party, well, the professor who had invited me there, I arrived a day early. He showed me on the internet that the tea party were coming out to protest me speaking at uh, Seminole University in Orlando, Florida. And I was a rotten, dirty, low life communist, and I was a socialist, and uh, they're glad that everything the FBI did to the Black Panther Party, they did, and they're happy that J. Edgar Hoover did it. Uh, they ran it on. Well, that particular engagement was extremely heavily advertised, a large university, what have you. And they had 600 seats set up in a gymnasium-type room, but with a raised platform stage quite wide and it was really those high 40 foot high ceilings and they had these giant screens on each side of the podium somewhat over that these cameras would project me speaking upon these big screens and as the people walked in all 600 seats and the Tea Party, about 70 Tea Party people in their green shirts and their little green hats, all 70 of them, walked into the back and got them some seats, trying to hold their little placards up, what have you, et cetera. And finally, I was introduced. And as usual, quite a few of the audience stood up and applauded me coming on. And I blew the Tea Party away. I mean, I blew them away for what they were in more ways than one, you know. <laughs> anyway, at the end of the event, the whole audience gave me a standing ovation. And uh, it made the Tea Party look like they had to go out with their tails between their butts, going out the side door, all 60 or 70 of them. The next year, the Koch brothers, who sponsors the Tea Party and Tea Party organizations on campuses, the Koch brothers, that's their money. These, oh please, stop. Put the lights on. Put the lights on. Keep the lights on. Let me explain why I need the lights on. I'm communicating with you. You put the lights on, I can't even see the faces. Now, when I get up here and say, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for any one people to dissolve the political bondage which I've connected, I'm talking to the people, I'm rapping to you. We communicate, so do not turn those lights down. That ain't the name of the game, you know what I mean? But 
Anyway, they, they sponsored these guys and they sent out letters to over a thousand universities. Letters and packets of information. Syllabus for courses that they wanted taught in universities. Several political science courses and other economic courses. Courses that they designed, the Koch brothers, that they designed. And about countering all so-called progressive speakers like Bobby Seale and whoever, et cetera. Well, the next year, and I'm used to at least 10 college lectures in Black History Month. A long time, I'm used to 10 college lectures in Black History Month for many, many years. My oldest, my middle son is a doctor now, and that boy got through medical school with a lot of them fees you guys paid me for speaking. <laughs> and he's a doctor now, you know, with his world health care advocacy that he wants to be, you know. But my point is, is uh, I got no speaking engagements that next month, that next year. And then Black History Month, I was shocked. I was very, very shocked. I mean, because for the Black Panther Party had been over, what, 30 odd years at that time. And one thing for sure, brothers and sisters, all my own left radical friends and whoever, et cetera, on college campuses saw to it that I got to the campuses to speak all across America, you know? So the next year we got on our high horse with my Facebook, et cetera, and blah, 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 and started doing our own advertising, et cetera. And we're back into it, but not good enough. At the same time, I'm trying to do a major feature film on my life story. And uh, it's very important that I do this story, that people know the Black Panther Party, how that Black Panther Party came about, why it came about, uh, its twists, its turns, uh, the who in government, in terms of the president, who was the main president? I want people, you students and people to be able to answer for it. Who launched the greatest attack against the Black Panther Party and was the president of the United States of America? Who did that? You know? How did the Black Panther survive that shootout at 41st and Central, December the 8th, 1969, 69? How did they do that and why? I was in jail at the time too. And how did I get my directives to them in that shootout, in that battle? And why is it, why is it after that last battle, after all that year, that my Black Panther Party was attacked? Then again, you got to know other things. How many Black Panthers were there? And how did they come about? How did I suddenly get 5,000 members prior to the death of Martin Luther King? Prior to the death of Martin Luther King, I only had 400 members in the Black Panther Party. From Seattle, Washington to San Diego, only 400 members. In the little chapters and little branches. Seattle, a small group in Portland, another group trying to emerge up in Eugene, Oregon. Then there was a um, Sacramento chapter with Charles Brunson, young Charles Brunson, a young black man. You know, and then the little chapters and branches I put together around the San Francisco and Bay Area, and Brother Bunchy Carter and John Huggins and others who had finally started the Southern California chapter of the Black Panther Party. You know, and then Brother Bell down in San Diego. I only had 400 members prior to Dr. Martin Luther King being killed. And even before Dr. Martin Luther King was killed, I had formed a coalition with SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And even my friend Eldridge Cleaver opposed it. I says, later for it, we're going to have it. I had an argument with him, you know, private argument. I never argued with other leadership in the Black Panther Party in front of other parliament, but, but private argument, I told him no. Yeah, but he believes in nonviolence, but nonviolence is a constitutional democratic civil human right. The First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States of America is the law of the land. It says that all citizens have a right to peacefully protest. What we have to do is defend that constitutional democratic civil human right. So if the Ku Klux Klan or some idiots come down here trying to attack our peaceful protest, we're going to pull our pistols out and we're going to shoot their ass because we defended our constitutional democratic civil human rights to peaceful protest. <laughs> so I'm arguing with elders to make him understand that. And we're going to have this coalition. We're going to work on In fact, the way it happened, the phone call came in. My secretary rose and she said, somebody named Abernathy? I said, I said, Reverend Ralph Abernathy? She said, I think so. I said, give me that phone. 
I says, hello. Is this Mr. Bobby Seal? He says, Bobby Seal? I says, you are? He says, Dr. Reverend Ralph Abernathy? I said, yes, sir. I perked up. See, I had a lot of respect for Martin Luther King in my early days. You know, I was still learning. Even before that happened, in 1962 is when I began to study and research my African and African American people's history of struggle. I was a student at Merritt College in Oakland, California. And I worked a full-time job at night at Kaiser Aerospace and Electronics. They had a NASA contract. You don't know that I used to work on the Gemini missile program. You don't know that I did electromagnetic field, black light, non-destruct testing for all engine frames with the Gemini missile program. You don't know that because Ronald Reagan and the COINTELPRO and the FBI told you I was a hoolum and a thug. That's what they were telling you. But there I was, a young man, 1962. This would be four years before I started the Black Panther Party, four years. And I heard Dr. Martin Luther King was coming. And I normally didn't go to hear hell and damnation preachers. But Martin Luther King was not a hell and damnation preacher. Martin Luther King was talking about how we got to change this racism out there, how we got to stop this institutionalized racism that perpetuates itself, et cetera, and so on. That's what Martin Luther King. And I was interested in that, at the same time studying my African and African American people's history of struggle. And I went to hear him speak at the Oakland Auditorium. Oakland Auditorium holds 7,000 people. Every seat was taken. Standing room only, 7,000 plus people standing. And Dr. King got to talking about all the different companies and business frameworks that discriminated against people of color. And he says all across America, they refused to hire people of color. Then he got on the bread companies in the San Francisco, Oakland Bay Area, where I was at. He says here in the San Francisco, Oakland Bay Area, Langendorf Bread Company and Kilpatrick's Bread Company will not hire people of color. He says, and all across America, all across America, Wonder Bread Company do not hire people of color. He says, we want to boycott them. And we want to boycott them so consistently and so profoundly, we want to make Wonder Bread wonder where the money went. <laughs> when Martin Luther King said that, I'm telling you, it inspired the whole audience. We hit our feet just applauding. This man was an inspiring man. It was more to him, you know, yeah, brother, oh, man, they do nonviolence. You're damn right. You got a right to nonviolence. See, I'd read that book also right around that time, a little bit after that, by Robert Williams, Negroes with Guns, 1959. He is an ex-Marine, United States Marine, now not in the Marines, and he's leading protests, peaceful protests downtown Monroe, North Carolina, trying to get these companies like Woolworths and other places to hire people of color. And they've been going on a couple of weeks. And then suddenly, one night, 30-odd cars fully loaded with Ku Klux Klaners, <coughs> sheets, white sheets in their head, 30 car loads and pickup trucks and crap, driving through the black community in North Monroe, North Carolina shooting it up, boom, 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 just all through the community. This is what happened in 1959. And later a good book was written called Negroes with Guns. What in effect happened, Robert Williams was forced out of the country. Exercised his First Amendment constitutional rights to go out and peacefully protest to try to get uh, uh, institutionalized racism changed with concerning the hiring of black folks in some of these businesses where they actually shop at. Now, as people do, I said, that kind of stuff inspired me, and I understood that. I had a great job, engineering department. But while I still worked there, I picked up a book by Jomo Kenyatta. The title of that book was called Facing Mount Kenya. I took that book to work with me. And in between inspecting engine frames with the Gemini missile program, you know, that was my department. I sit down and do what I want to do. I started reading this book. And I discovered a young black man from the Kikuyu people in Kenya who had went to England and got him a degree, came to America, got him another degree in anthropology, what have you, et cetera, and went back. But he became involved 
and organizing his people out from under the yoke of English colonialism over his country in Kenya. And I says, wait a minute. Tarzan does not run Africa. In other words, brothers, what I'm trying to tell you, I was brainwashed. Yeah, I get A's in mathematics. That's me. I always got A's in mathematics. Architecture, design. I, have, I was one of the luckiest young men it was around in terms of skills, trades, and professions. My father was a master carpenter and builder. My grandfather was a master carpenter and builder. Weirgate, Texas, east of Jasper, Texas, almost to the Louisiana border. My grandfather built 500 homes in that kind. And you probably wonder, how did this black man do that? It had to do with the banking family in Jasper, Texas. See, my mama and my daddy was born in a town and the county called Jasper, Texas. When the Emancipation Proclamation came along in Juneteenth in Texas, evolved around, my great-grandmother Winnie went to work for Old Man Seal, the white banker, the liberal white banker in Jasper, Texas. A year later, another young man came and went to work for that family, the Seal family, who ran the banking business there. His name was Peter. And they decided to get married and coming out of slavery with no last names, they adopted the Seal family's name, S-E-A-L-E. -E. Ergo, Bobby Seal, okay? <laughs> Boom, some guy tried to get me to get an X one day. I said, no, I think I'm gonna keep the Seal. <laughs> anyway, my point is, that is a piece of history in my connection and understanding how I arrived to have all these trades and skills United States Air Force structure repair, high performance aircraft, all that kind of stuff, architectural design, et cetera, and so on, mechanical design, the whole gauntlet, that was me. I say all this because the counterintelligence program and the politicians, Ronald Reagan, the governor of California at the time I, when, when I was getting involved, was calling me a hoodlum and a thug. They stereotype you. And then they come around and they want to come down and shoot you and kill you and murder, and they don't want to say nothing with you, what, what you're about as a, as a positive. And they do that to all people, any people, any, any people who have some progressive understanding, have some political insight, have some organizing efforts that they're doing to get rights, constitutional rights, et cetera. That's what they do. So I created an organization called the Black Panther Party. Little of you know that at the time I created the organization, I was actually employed by the city government of Oakland, California. Department of Human Resources. That's really where I was at. I quit my engineering job. And I went out to create some job programs like Dr. Martin Luther King had influenced me to do. In fact, I wound up in the beginning of 1974 in Richmond, California, North Richmond, California, a community out there in North Richmond, California, predominantly African-American community largely half, 50% unemployed, poor and low income, what have you, et cetera. And I created a youth jobs program, me and several other students, three young white students and three black students. We happened to be working for some departmental framework with a contract with the government for canvas in the community. And that's what we were doing. And we got together every day and we got to talking about institutionalized racism, et cetera. And we decided to create this North Richmond Tutorial Program, a youth jobs program, a youth jobs program in North Richmond, California. We put our skills and our abilities together. We wrote our proposals. We went before the War on Poverty Board. We got funded. We got matching funds. We got a building. We bought the building. We hired in 100 youth out of that North Richmond community. We proved in our arguments that a 10th grader, even if he's a dropout, a 10th grader can be made to go back to school and give him a job tutoring a first grader in one plus one equal two and two plus two equal four. A couple of them boys, one time I caught them in there after they was in there a week. Yeah, they're little tutors, you know, little first grade tutors. They're in the 10th grade or was in the 10th grade. We got them back in school. But you know, they picked up these old bad cultural habits. So there they was, I walked in the room and they shooting dice. Their tutors over there ain't doing nothing. I said, what the hell's going on in here? Get up. I said, get up. I'm upset with them. 
And I says, get out here. And I got a two and I said, no, wait a minute, get back in there. You, come here, come here, give, give me them dice. And I took them outside. I says, go down to the store. Gave him three, three four dollars. And buy me three more sets of dice. You hear me? What? I said, go get my dice. Okay, Mr. Seal. Come back with the dice. I walked in the room. I took a, a dice on this table, a dice on this table, a set of dice on this table. Then I had four tutors. I says, now, tell that tutor to throw them dice. How he said, come on, little Joe. Boom. You want four. Boom. It came five. I said, have your tutor write down five. Have him write down five. I said, now throw them dice again. Seven. I said, I want to multiply. I want to subtract it and multiply it. Now, throw your dice. And I turned the negative into the positive relevancy of what tutoring was about, what the job was about that I was paying for them about. But of course, what I did do with all these youth is that on Saturdays, on Saturdays, I taught them their African and African American history, what they were, how they were human beings, et cetera, the face of this earth. Get rid of all this old self-hate crap. You know, I'd read and digested material like Marvel J. Herskovitz's work, Myth of the Negro Past. If you ever know this book, sit down. It's a dissertative kind of work. It was written some time ago, but it's very, very good. It helps you get beyond all the negative stuff that went down in slavery and all the negative crap that's been propagated by black, about black folks. And in that particular book, Myth of the Negro Past by Marvel J. Herskovitz, he made reference to an African-American, a young African-American man, at the time, who was a PhD, English, and a linguistic work that he had researched, did field research for, and had published this work, Surviving Africanisms in Black Language, it was by Dr. Lorenzo Dow Turner. I was just a young man in 62 and 63. And I went and read that book, and I went to the University of California to try to find that book. The number came in was a heavy reference book, so I couldn't check it out. I was not matriculated at the University of California. I said, but I got to get this book. Well, it would cost you, uh, you $35 a year for a special card. Where are you matriculated? I said, I'm in Merritt College, $35. Well, I had the money. I had a great job. Here, give me this book. So that means I could come up there and get any reference material out for a year, you know, et cetera. And I took that book home and found out why we dropped all the T-H-E-R-A-R, -R, rolling our sounds in our language, in our African-American people's language and talk, which represented certain idiomatic expressions, not idiot in the negative sense, idiomatic expressions, dis, that, dim, yo, mo, and fo. Even you go, some of you young folks don't know this because you had a chance to know and understand and, have, and speak formal English, but for everybody, at this time in the 1960s, people dropped a T-H-E-R-A-R -R rolling R sounds. And I found out that I did the same thing in many cases. Not all, not my technical language, because I always would master my technical language. But in everyday colloquial use, hey brother, what's happening? Ain't no brother. Hey man, let me have some more of that wine over there. Slow that down, let me have some more of that wine over there. Some mo of that wine over there. He didn't say, let me have some more of that wine over there. <laughs> ah, what's going on here? The Myth of the Negro Past was a great book for me, especially this particular subject matter. I found out that Dr. Lorenzo Dow Turner, a PhD, had done 12 years of field research this man was like W. Du Bois. He'd get grants and stuff to do various research back in the days. And this is what Dr. Renzo Dow Turner did. He went to Senegal. He went to Ghana. Most of the English-speaking countries of Africa, where Africans had adopted and used and began to try to use English language, et cetera, all the way down to Angola. And this brother found out that there were no T-H-E-R-A-R -R rolling R sounds at all in the West African languages where black folks had been extracted from through the period of the 200-year-old slave trade. Wow, what is he saying here? He's further saying that you're extracted. Even if you're 12 years old, you're not conditioned to use T-H-E-R-A-R -R rolling R sounds. 
So if you're not conditioned to use it, then what? What are you saying? He says, you're going through an oppressive acculturation process. If you're 10 or 12 years old, a new slave, if you're 14, 19, or 20, et cetera, and then you're forced in a situation where you're not in communication with other African people's languages or your ethnic group's languages, then you're forced to learn this English language. Boom. And if you are forced to do that in the process, when it comes up where you say dis, dat, dim, yo, mo, and fo, rather than saying this, that, them, your, more, and for. You drop the T-H-E-R-A-R rolling R signs in your attempt to speak this language. And that's why we pronounced those words like that back in those days, more so. He even discovered surviving African words. A few of them, Bobo, one who cannot hear, etc. Yam to eat. You know, I did other anthropological papers too in that time and that period on agricultural sites of West Africa, meaning you can find certain ethnic groups of people in the world who did first cultivate certain plants. And the racist, the racist eugenics of England at the time, back in the late 1800s, had declared that no Africans at all, in no way, shape, fashion, or form, had ever evolved to be setting up, cultivating any particular plant, food, or something that's useful. But it wasn't true when I did my research. I found out that there were plants first cultivated in West Africa by Africans. Not only was the yam, the stringy yam, not the non-stringy yam, first cultivated, Cotton was first cultivated in West Africa. Ah, oh, people don't know that. Various melons were first cultivated. The kola nuts, et cetera, were first cultivated in West Africa. Peanuts or gubas were first cultivated in West Africa. Ah, surviving African words? Oh, ain't no such thing. See, the history was taken away. The understanding of our history and our culture and our involvement, that oppressive acculturation process over many generations. And there I was, a young man learning and understanding and making a connection and connecting the dots. Just that dim yo mo and fo. It reminded me of something when I was 12 years old, 11 years old. Lady used to holler out the window to, to her son, Jimmy Lee, Jimmy Lee, boy, get in this house. Did you hear me, boy? Shut that door. And you could hear a voice, clean this mess up off that floor. Get in this house, shut that door, and clean this mess up off this floor. Ah, I guess over in the standard English speaking white community would be shut that door and clean this mess up off the floor. My point becomes to teach these young brothers and sisters in that Richmond community why they dropped them T H E R A R, rolling R sounds was just fascinating to them. In other words, we're teaching something that's an evolutionary process. Some teachers, even black teachers, didn't know, know any better, would hit kids on the knuckles, black kids on the knuckles. You're speaking pigeon language. That makes the child feel inferior. You see what I mean? Traumatizing the inferior complex. So when I researched this kind of stuff, and it wasn't the only thing I researched. I researched all the blacks who fought in the Civil War. I researched so, researched so much stuff. But this was the kind of stuff that made me up and got me to understand in a broad sense. And of course, I wasn't stuck only on culture. Me in the high-tech world, metallurgy, et cetera, through the Air Force, what have you, et cetera, boom, 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 boom. I focused on Africa based on its mental resources. The mental resources. Back in 1964-63, I did a first lecture at college. So I researched why in the Leopoldville Congo conflict was going on there. And it was all about the southern Katanga province and Leopoldville Congo. What was happening in the southern Katanga province of Leopoldville Congo? One quarter of all the world's copper ore was being produced out of the Katanga, Southern Katanga province. That's what it was, the mineral resources in the bowels of the earth. And if you understand politics, if you understand Kwame Nkrumah and his history, build the empire. I looked up in the process of my study, boom, 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 Kwame Nkrumah was building a 
smelting plant for bauxite. And I look, I said, bauxite? I already knew what that was. Bauxite is the basis ore for all aluminum products in the world. You have to imagine and understand the economics of that. That if you have the basic ore, and we found it not only in Ghana, but next door in Togoland and other countries all over Western Africa. My God, bauxite was so plentiful. It was much more plentiful than the copper ore in the Southern Katangas province of the Neopopio Congo. Whoa, this is what blew my mind. It made my and me understand, whoa, you have to build this empire. You have to build political frameworks where you set rules, et cetera, so the people can have access to their mineral resources, et cetera, and so on and so on. And they can sell and market these things, and they can build a decent standard of living. That was the thing with me. My father and people were home builders and house builders. My father built our first home when I finished it when I was seven years old and poured out to Texas. He was a master carpenter and builder. And he did all of this, you know, right before the end of World War II. And I wound up in Berkeley, California at the end of World War II, turning nine years old. I was eight, and that next month I would turn nine. Berkeley, California. Living out in California. Growing up in California. And when I got an understanding of my meaning, the relevancy of what was what, the economics of why we were fighting and struggling to try to grow, why we were being colonialized in Africa, why we were being, have been exploited, ex viciously exploited through the process of the history of slavery, murdered and exploited. Wow, boom. All in this period, in those early 60s, when I digested Dr. Herbert Aptheker's documentation of 250 slave revolts, 250 slave revolts. I mean, I didn't know that this could happen. You see, some of y'all hear me now, but this history was not prevalent at that time. We had to research and find this out. It was not taught in colleges at all. It wasn't taught in schools. You mean 200 black folks that had 250 slavery votes? According to Dr. Herbert Aptek, what he documented as 250 slavery votes from the year 1800 to the year 1859, 1800 to 1859, 200, he says involved 10 or more slaves. He says there was other revolt that involved a lesser number of slaves, down to one and two slaves many times who were, who were revolting. So to me, I began to say, wait a minute, so we didn't just sit on our ass. We was really trying to fight our goddamn way out of that. They just hid the history. See what I mean? This is what was happening. And boom, come the Civil War. The Civil War, I started reading about that. W.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction. Why did Abraham Lincoln say, and this forever, fourth free in the Emancipation Proclamation? It was only a military tactic, really, that Abraham Lincoln was dealing with. Because he and the North was losing the war to the South at this time. And they could not recruit any more of the young whites or whoever to come down and fight because it looked like it was going to be a war to end slavery. And so they were, many of them wasn't interested. So what Abraham Lincoln did, he wrote an Emancipation Proclamation two years into the war. And then to have a fourth free. The very next lines in the Emancipation Proclamation, you know what it says? All able-bodied black men will be taken into the Northern Union Army. Oh my God, and read Dr. Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois' Black Reconstruction and other material that also documents this. 168,000 black men was enlisted into the Northern Union Army, rapidly trained, gave them a blue coat, what have you, and those blacks say, oh yeah, if we can end slavery this way, we're gonna kick some ass, and that's what them brothers did. They went out there and kicked the Confederates' ass, and that's today why these Racists down there, some of them hardcore racists to this day can't, ain't got over the fact yet that them black soldiers kicked their ass. And Abraham Lincoln as much said it. Now, I'm just talking about human involvement in the politics, in the range of things, etc. 168,000 enlisted into the Northern Union Army. Another 100 plus thousand 
the women, et cetera, came across the lines to do whatever kind of work necessary to back up the soldiers. You know, in World War II, for every soldier that was out there fighting, it took 10 people at home to back him up. The work and production of 10 people to back him up. You have to understand those relationships and war, what happens, et cetera. So there they had a couple of hundred thousand blacks in the Northern Union Army working and people working to support that. And the Reconstruction period came. Our first United States Congresswoman was elected in that period. People don't know that. 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Right? This is the kind of material that I, that I digested in 62, 63, 64. 65. Then I created the Black History Fact Group and I got black history into the curriculum at Merritt College. Then I was working for the city government of Oakland, California. I was running youth jobs programs there. You remember I created a youth jobs program in Richmond. I ran another youth jobs program in Oakland, California. And I was a community liaison working for the city government of Oakland, Department of Human Resources. That was me. These are all the things and the organizations and things I did preceding the Black Panther Party that led up to the, to, to call the to creation of the Black Panther Party. And it evolved to a point, and I'm still employed by the city government of Oakland when we created the Black Panther Party. Still employed. And you and I decided after we wrote the 10 point platform and program and got it refined and went to see Melvin Newton, Huey's brother, Huey's older brother, six or seven years older than Huey, doing graduate work at the University of California, Melvin Newton was, that was Huey's older brother. Took our 10 point platform and program there. Huey likes to say in his little book, Revolutionary Suicide, and Bobby Seale, he was really no writer. And it tickles me that he would say that crap. He wasn't no damn writer either. <laughs> I mean, I got A's in mathematics, one, I know that. My language art skills, C. You know, I was always a C person in that stuff. But in the mathematics and the demographics, don't mess with me. I know the application of the quadratic formula. I know probability theory, et cetera, and so on. I know all of this stuff. That's me. Anyway, we wrote into that 10-point platform and program. Number one, we wanted power to determine our destiny in our own black community. Number two, we wanted full employment for our people. Number three, we wanted decent housing for the shelter of human beings. Number four, we wanted all the into the robbery and exploitation of our black people and our black community. You know. Number five, I think we said we wanted all black men and women to be exempt from any military service because, you know, this, this war wasn't our war. Number seven, we want, we want to meet it in to police brutality and murder of black people. Number eight, we want all black men and women who've been tried by all white juries, all black men who've been tried by all white juries to have a right to another trial so we can have some black folks who represent the average reasoning person from the black community to be on jurors on some of these trials so they can get a fair trial. That's what I demand. We want to end to the robbery and exploitation of our black community. We want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. See, Ronald Reagan, J. Edgar Hoover, politicians all across the country call us a bunch of hoodlums and thugs. But when I summed that 10-point platform and program up, and remember, when we summed it up and wrote this program, we didn't have a name for this organization yet at that time. And I paraphrased the first two paragraphs of the founding documentation of this very country. You know what the founding documentation of this very country says? When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for any one people to dissolve the political bondage which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitled them, a decent respect to the opinions of humankind dictate that they should declare the causes which impel them to dissolve that damn political bondage that we are subjected to. When a long train of abuses and usurpations pursues and invariably evinces a design to reduce a people under absolute despotism, then it is the right of the people to alter or change that government and provide new guards for your future security and happiness. 
Now, you got to read that. Read it the way we wrote it, too, and paraphrased it. That says a lot. It says you got to alter and change the crap. If it's oppression and exploitation, et cetera, you got to alter and change that. That means you got to organize, you got to pull together. So we decided the first thing we was going to operate on was point number seven. We want to meet it into police brutality and murder by But as a tactic, what was the tactic? If we would patrol the police with law books, tape recorders, and loaded weapons, legal weapons, the very big difference between illegal weapons and legal weapons, because we always had legal weapons. If we patrol the police, we'll probably kill, capture the imagination of the people. And my intent, I said, well, Hewitt, that's what I need. What you mean? I said, because I, I can organize people. If I can get them in, organize them. I said, and we don't necessarily have to have everybody carrying a gun. He says, right, nobody's got this there because the objective here is, is to get them organized. If they get them organized, we can get voter registration going, and we can take over the city government of Oakland, California. That's what I want to do. But by that time, I already clocked. I knew that Oakland was 42% African American, and another 14% at that time was Chicano Mexican American brothers and sisters. You know what I mean? And then that was a liberal white community up there in the Montclair district of Oakland, and all these things. I knew all this, working for city government and things like that. I said, man, I said, we can take over the majority of the seats in the city council. And which is, I said, well, Hugh, it's about power. Oh, yeah, well, power is the ability to define phenomena. I said, then in turn, make it act in desired manner. I said, we know that, Huey. I said, these guys are running around here talking about black power this, black power that, black power this. They ain't got no political power seats. What is a political power seat? A legislative body? A city council ain't nothing but a legislative body. The county seat, the county seat, and county supervisor, supervisor, nothing but legislators of one kind or another on one level and dealing with a lot of other problems, allocating monies and funds to get certain things done, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. So if you don't have any political power seats, you're not going to change anything. And that was my organization, and that was my objective of going out there to patrol and observe them police and capture the imagination of the people. And how did we capture them? My friend Huey was probably at his best that one night, second week of January. We'd been training these brothers and sisters, and we only had a handful of 14, 15 people, that's all. Didn't have no whole lot of people. They weren't out there ready to go jump out there carrying no guns. They didn't know what that was about. Nor did they even know we was out there at first. They had to find out we was even out there. And that one night we had got everybody trained. Never point a loaded weapon at a person. If you point a loaded weapon at a person, it constitutes assault with a deadly weapon. Huey was in law school at the time. Had been two years in law school. And I insisted upon Huey that he find every legal framework so that we make sure we got a legal operation going. And he did that. When that one... All these people had gathered on the sidewalk. We walked down, the cop was sitting out here. He hadn't even looked up to see us. He's sitting in his passenger side seat of his car, and he's got the door open, and he's talking on the radio, and he's trying to write. His arrestee is at the back with his hand on the back of the trunk. We walk up. He's out there 15, 16 feet. You know, it was a wide street. 7th Street was a really wide street, three lanes plus parking. The red light district in the, in the black community in Oakland, California, nightlife district. And there we are. We didn't walk down, 14 of us. All of us had our little uniforms on. Black beret, blue shirt. If the sister was there, she put a blue blouse on. If you couldn't afford a leather jacket, I gave money up to go buy good to go buy, because I had a very good job, you know what I mean, at the city government of Oakland. <laughs> I says, all right, here, you guys, you go in. I says, I says y'all, you, you, go, go buy bush jackets, the black bush jackets. You know, you black bush jackets, and I want them ironed and stuff. And I want you to clean up your stuff and clean your pants up. And little Bobby Hudson said, well, we, uh, you want me to take a shower just to go out here and patrol some old funky police? I said, yeah, little Bobby. Well, Chairman, I said, well, yes. Now, do you know why? No, Chairman. I said, because we are not blippies. 
What's a blippy? I say, a black hippie that don't take no bath. <laughs> I said, I wish to wear. I says, we're going out here to be organized in front of the people. You don't come in front of a bunch of poor, low-income, hardcore, working-class people out there, and you don't show no organization or appearance. You go in the black community out there stinking, talking about, we're going to organize y'all. If you stinking, them black folks say, boy, you need to organize some soap under your ass before you come down here <laughs> trying to organize somebody. Who you think you is, boy? I'm just saying, I was on them. You're going to organize. And boy, we got out there that night, man, and that cop get out of his car, and all these people standing on the sidewalk, and this one sister, when we first walked up, she's a well-dressed sister, and she kids come out of Slim Jenkins' um, nightclub, and she was walking, and as we walked past with our guns, she says, well, 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 African-American sister, so she says, you young folks look quite spiffy there. <laughs> you know, and we got there, and the cop jumps out, you have no right to observe me. And he was shining moment. I ever give him credit. This is where he shined. He was says, no, California State Supreme Court ruling states that every citizen has a right to stand and observe a police officer carrying out their duty as long as they stand a reasonable distance away. A reasonable distance in that particular ruling was constituted as 8 to 10 feet. I'm standing approximately 20 feet from you and will observe you whether you like it or not. And that sister on the sidewalk, she says, well, go head on and tell it, brother. <laughs> Tell it, say it again. I have never heard. The cop says, is that gun loaded? He would say, if I know it's loaded, it's good enough. Well, I like, I have to say, he would say, step back, no gun. He would cited something, the Supreme Court, somebody versus so and so and so, therefore you cannot remove my property from me without due process of law. Step back, you cannot touch my weapon. And this tall black brother over here, he said, man, what kind of Negroes is these? <laughs> It had never happened before. We were disciplined. It was 14 of us. And one sister, Geraldine, with them earrings hanging. She had that big afro, and she had that ever, and she had that neat bush jacket, and a big 44 pistol that Richard Aoki, our Japanese buddy, had given her. Strapped down to her side. Half of us had long guns, half of us had short guns. Nobody pointed a weapon at people. Only one person talked, Huey had said at the office before we got there. One person. Let the police first say something. Never say nothing to the police first. Because Huey researched the law. If you say something first, you could be charged with interfering with the police officer carrying out their duty. But if the police says something to you, then you can answer them. That's why the cop says, you have no right to observe me. And Huey laid him out with the law. Not no old man, or oh, I got my gun, what you gonna do? I ain't got time for that. See them kind of brothers, I mean, yeah, I know they, 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 they got heart and all this kind of stuff, but their thinking ain't right. See what I mean? They, they, they do stuff too fast, too quick and stuff, they're not disciplined. Anyway, I've been in the United States military. I knew what the value of discipline was. Yes, it was United States Air Force, but I knew the value of discipline. You know, so he said, what kind of Negroes is these? The cop looked, and he looked, and then he started looking and realized there's 14 of us with guns. He got his arrestee, put him in the car, protected his head, etc. Boom, set his passenger side door and walked around, and as he walked around, he stopped, and he wanted to look real close. He was looking at Geraldine. It's nighttime, you know, it's not daytime, it's nighttime, but the glitter of those earrings hanging down. And he has to make sure this is a, one of them is a woman. And he got in the car and drove off. Four little kids come running around the corner with some other kids. Look at that. See, I told you. And I says, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Bobby Seal. I'm chairman of the Black Panther Party. This is my friend Huey Newton here. He's the Minister of Defense of my Black Panther Party. It's a new organization. We're going to put this organization together and we're going to have programs in the community and we're going to unite our brothers and sisters and people in the community. We're going to unite all the votes and we're going to take over some of those political power seats, some of those city council seats and the mayor seats. We're going to take them over because you can't run around here talking about black power, this black power, that, and you ain't got no political power seats. Y'all with me? If you want to, meetings tomorrow at our new headquarters, 5624 Grove Street.
and we'd be there. And I did have 25 people show up and only had seven people join, but that's all right. That was the beginning of the Black Panther Party. What happened was we went out there to capture the imagination of the people so we could better and more rapidly organize them. But we not only captured the imagination of them, we captured the imagination of them damn cops. <laughs> and what captured the imagination of one, we were disciplined, one person talked, we never pointed the guns, and boom, they stand, they look at that. Oh shit. I can imagine that cop going back, well, did they move on you with the guns? He says, no. Boom, 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 boom. They stood there with their guns. They all watched me, yes. See what I mean? It was disciplined, it was organized. It's very easy to go out there, well, we got a gun, yeah, that's bullshit. Gun is only a tool to be used at a particular time in a particular situation, and especially for your human survival, where you have to defend yourself, like Robert Williams and like other people, like the black soldiers, the 168,000 black soldiers who got the guns and fought the Confederates that led to the end of slavery as an institutionalized slavery. That's very, very important to understand that history. At least that's my, that's the forte of history and stuff that impressed me in a lot of ways to create the Black Panther Party. By May 2nd, 1967, we were seven months old. I am leading an armed delegation into the California State Legislature to read executive mandate number one. The book I have back there, Seize the Time, has executive mandate number one, has rules of the Black Panther Party, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all that stuff. I wrote that book in jail, because I was a political prisoner from, uh, for a couple of years until I was able to get out of jail in 1971, from August 1969 to 1971. I'm just saying that was an organization that evolved, but even then, when I led that armed delegation, that caused us to be known around the world. Black Panthers invade the California State Legislature, armed Black Panthers. Still, we did not point guns at people because we knew the law, and we were quite legal. They made a law a month later after I read that thing that said no one could carry loaded guns within inside city limits within 150 feet of public property. Public property included all bro roadways, byways, and public sidewalks. And of course, we were not gonna go out there with unloaded guns, because remember, our guns were always loaded. Some people thought our guns were unloaded, we always, I would never went out there with unloaded guns. Never. Because you're gonna go out there, et cetera, we say we would defend ourselves. If the cops had moved in a rowdy or wrong way, boom, we would have shot. And I'm an expert shot. I was an expert shot when I was 12 years old. My father bought me my first 30 30 Winchester high powered rifle. With hollow tip ammo, ammo, those kind of, that kind of ammunition, we can knock an elephant down with that kind of stuff. You know, I mean, that overkill stuff, killing the animals in the woods, I got rid of that later, later in years, but yeah, we hunt deer, we hunted bear, and we hauling all kind of small game, et cetera. But we didn't throw our game away, we ate our game. You know what I mean? But my point is, I was a, I was a young person, I wanted to do something. I had quit my engineering job, now I'm working for the city government. Uh, I was involved, you know, I got married finally in 1966 you know, et cetera, and then I told my wife, now if you marry me, remember I'm a revolutionary. Um, we broke up behind that very thing three or four years later. You can't do this no more. I says, no, uh-uh. I got people in prison, they're my party members, I got responsibility, I don't wanna hear all that, you know. So we had to split up, you know what I mean? But that's another thing. My point is, is that we became a very, popular and well-known organization for standing up. But more importantly, we became popular and well-known for the Free Breakfast for Children program. That has more to do with why the power structure attacked us than whether or not we had guns. You have to understand this, if you know it. Now, in the research for my film, this is a drama, I'm not doing a documentary, I'm doing a dramatization in research for my film. Nixon was elected, 
November 1968. He would not be sworn in until, what, the 20th or so of January. But Nixon, right after he was elected in November, a week later, had a meet with J. Edgar Hoover. I didn't see J. Edgar Hoover until he popped up on television in the first week of December. That's when he popped up. And what was he saying? What was J. Edgar Hoover saying, head of the FBI? The Black Panther Party is a threat to the internal security of America. The only reason that Black Panthers have guns is to come into the white community and shoot and kill white people. This is J. Edgar Hoover propagating this crap. Shoot white people? We coalesced with 20 different goddamn white left radical organizations and groups, along with all the other black organizations, along with the other Asian organizations, along with the other Chicano, Mexican American brothers and sisters organizations. We coalesced with them. We work with them. The Black Panthers is the black community's Ku Klux Klan. This is what the counterintelligence program propagated all across America. They have press releases they sent out. And they did not send the press release, the only, the pre very press releases they sent to the press, they sent the press, same press releases to the politicians. That's why Mayor Daley jumps up on national television in 1968. The only reason the Black Panthers have guns is to come into the white community and shoot and kill white people. Now, you have some little separatist black nationalists or you have some little xenophobic black nationalist brothers and sisters who just don't know no better. Yeah, that's right, fuck that. We're going to kill some of them motherfuckers. See, that's that bullshit. It's not what human liberation is about. You start stepping outside of the civility of what it's about. See, but that's why we had to have political education classes in the Black Panther Party. You don't come in here practicing no racism with me in this organization. I'm going to teach you some dialectics. What the hell is dialectics? Just be quiet, brother. You're going to learn dialectics. <laughs> You're going to learn some dialectical principles. Quantitative increase, quantitative decrease causes a qualitative leap or change. Now, my brother Huey, he's a good debater. He's, uh, he's not an inspirational speaker at all, never was. But he would say, uh, brothers and sisters, if we could first agree on the dialectical principle that quantitative increase or quantitative decrease uh, causes a qualitative leap or change, I think then we can move forward. And I sit in the side, I say, oh no, he, would, he, would, he, would. he lost the whole damn audience. Because <laughs> me, you have to know, if you know my history, not only am I a hunter and a fisherman, a carpenter, a builder, you know what I mean? non destructive tests for missile parts, what have you, et cetera. I'm a stand-up comedian, and I'm also a jazz drummer. I've been that and done that, you know? So to me, I'm an improvisational kind of person. You know, brothers and sisters coming into Black Panther Party, you know, new ones coming in, I says, all right, today is another PE class that you have to learn the dialectical principle of quantitative increase, quantitative decrease. You're gonna learn the decrease increase factor. The increased amount of times that you sell your Black Panther Party newspaper in the designated precinct where you work, and the increased amount of times when you sell that paper, you discuss things with various people in the community. You are decreasing the apathy and increasing the consciousness. You have to get like a preacher. You got to decrease the ignorance that's going on out there in the community. And you got to give them some information, brother so that they have a better understanding of who their oppressors is. See, you can go all kinds of ways. It's improvisation. You know what I mean? Boom, 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 boom. Quantitative increase, quantitative decrease. Me, sometimes I put a big blackboard on wheels, and I would say quantitative increase, italics, boom, 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 in my drafting style printing, or quantitative decrease, and I put decrease under increase in italics, causes a qualitative and I put that in the link, in, 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 in that chart. Cause a qualitative leap or change. Just a process of taking a little dialectical dialectics. Probably the most dialectical principles, that is the best one that's quite applicable in trying to help teach brothers and sisters 
their political work that they're doing and so they could see the results of it. So the increased amount of times that we have rallies in the community, increased amount of programs that we put in the community and we unify the people around it, et cetera, and so on, so on, so on, so on. We unify, we're decreasing something negative and putting up something positive in terms of the people, unifying around something practical and real. The free breakfast for children program, the free sickle cell anemia testing program. I mean, brothers and sisters got so good. I mean, I went to chapters and branches all across this country to teach these brothers. Teach them understand, they start understand. Nobody was dunces. They start coming up with other kind of programs. Richmond, or the Richmond, Virginia branch came up with the free pest control program. Winston-Salem, North Carolina came up with the free ambulance program. They went out and got a whole bunch of white liberals and, white and, and blacks together to gather funds, et cetera, to, to not only buy the ambulance and buy all the equipment and get that in there, they got their 501 C3 status, they got budget and stuff, and put a free ambulance program for that Alderman district that they were in, that city council district that they were in in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Sister Audrey Jones, she ran the whole Massachusetts State chapter of the Black Panther Party. She was the first one who came up with the free, free pharmacy program. I mean, I'm telling you, one, you, once these young brothers and sisters out there was organizing, selling the papers every day, et cetera, boom, 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 boom. I said, but you got to put these programs together. And as you put the programs together, you constantly have a voter registration drive because the objective is to get all these votes unified so we can take over some of them political policies and we can really change things. That was the objective. Increase, decrease factor. You had to know that. I mean, I made sure I do shit graphically so people really understand. And more and more come in, there's bigger sessions like this here. One day I walked in, I had five, five people carrying big five gallon cans full of soil. Each one of them had a plant in it. Sit them on the table. This first one over here had a big juicy plume of green for a carrot. The next one had a not so big. The next one was down there, and over here was a little bit. What was I doing here? What was I demonstrating? And this can here, the proper depth to bury a carrot seed is one and three quarter inches. Well, the next can, I decreased it to only one inch, and the next can only to three quarters of an inch, and the next can only to a half an inch depth, and the last can only to a quarter of an inch depth. In the first can, I gave all the necessary water and the necessary fertilizer and the necessary sunshine. Ah, you see all the factors included there? Ah, just the graphics. And I decreased it and prorated to the depth down to the one quarter. So over here, when we pulled the carrot out, we had this quality carrot. Qualitative leap of change, right? And as we decreased it, over here we had a little shrivel up, a little shrivel up carrot. I said, so the brothers we had to kick out the party the other day for throwing all the leaflets away in the trash can, we don't need them. We need y'all to act like and get all the water, get your work out there, you assign to your precincts and your location where to work at, sell your Black Panther Party newspaper. Everybody had to sell a, 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 a hundred newspapers a week. And some people only sell a hundred newspapers because a lot of their work in the party took up time. But you had some brothers and sisters out there, brother. I was just talking to some out here, right here. Man, we sell 500 papers a week. And they were proud of this. But they understood the increased amount of people that they sell the papers to, the decrease in the apathy, and increase in the consciousness. And they could see that result. That's what you had to do. And you couldn't come in my organization talking about, hey, you say, what you have to understand is the white man is a devil. I said, brother, that's totally unscientific. What? I said, just what I said. I said, you got some dumbass, crazy racists out here that uh, metaphorically act like a, 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 a devil. I says, but I'm an anthropologist, I told him, because I had taken every anthropology course, all four courses at Merritt College. I loved anthropology. I love good science, good proven scientific evidentiary fact. Don't bring me a bunch of mythical facts. It is important that your ideas, your beliefs, and your understanding correspond as much as possible correctly to reality. My Aunt Zelma, when I was 11, turning 12 years old, 
She was a staunch Christian. She was my mother's identical twin. Aunt Zelma and my mother was named Thelma. Thelma and Zelma, identical twins. She'd come to live with us for a short period. And Aunt Zelma heard me in the back room talking to the other kids. No, it ain't. No, it ain't. It's 25,000 miles all the way around the earth. I'm arguing with the kids. You know, I read my little astronomy. I'm 11 years old. I got my little facts down, right? This and that and them and yours. I'm dropping my T-H-E-R sounds while I explain at the same time, blah, blah, blah. You know, and then, and then the earth, the earth take a 600 million mile trip all the way around the sun every 365 days. Oh boy, I got my stuff going. Ain't Zelma came in the room, shut up that old science mess, talking about the earth is round. Come here, boy. She mauled my, twist my ear and mauled my head. Boy, you're going straight to hell. You're going to get in that fire and you're going to burn and that devil's going to put that pitchfork, that old science mess. I mean, these guys were traumatizing. <laughs> They were traumatizing, but I stuck to my guns. It was some months later that we were out at Playland outside of San Francisco near the beach there. And then Zelma came all the way over into that carnival Playland and grabbed my hand and drug me out. Now look out there, Bobby. She pointing out at the ocean, calm ocean. What you see, boy? And you know, I'm thinking Zelma get ready to hit me in the head. <laughs> <laughs> I say the ocean in them. Boy, can't you see out there? It's flat, 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 flat. You can't be running around here talking about the earth is round. Don't you see how flat it is out there? See, to this very day, broader sense of what that. When I say I learned the application and probability theory of the quadratic formula in college math, that's important to me because it helps me understand. It helps my ideas correspond more correctly to reality. See, Aunt Zelma's myth and the mythical misunderstandings of so many groups of people, et cetera, and they have these myths, and I know it's based on fears and misunderstandings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but you cannot progress if you run around basing things on mythical misunderstandings, unscientific facts and notions. You see what I mean? That's what it's about, and that's what I was about, and that's the way I organized the Black Panther Party. All power to all the people, every last one of us, any of the avaricious, racist, corporate monopoly, capitalistic assholes from the Koch brothers back and the rest of them around the world, et cetera, boom, boom, boom. It's time for the people, step by step, piece by piece, protest after protest. In many cases, some of us are going to die, et cetera, boom, 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 to organize and get more and more and more dedicated, I say dedicated, progressive type politicians, and especially more women in these political seats. I mean, we got it. We, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tell you, brothers and sisters, you, you have to understand this. We live in an overdeveloped, high tech, fast paced, computerized, scientific, technological social order. We're not living even in the 40s or the 50s or the 60s. We didn't have no computers in the 1960s. All we had was an AB Dick machine and a Correcto Selectric typewriter we thought was the top kind of uh, information uh, uh, m machine there was. You know what I mean? But when that Arab Spring hit a few years ago in Egypt, and man, I looked up on that news, I said, eight million people, whoa. And they did it with that communications technology. Ah, see, we can do this stuff. But at the same time, we don't just do the protests. We learn to organize. In Ferguson today, yes, I'm willing to teach you, brothers and sisters, what needs to be done. And you're going to teach yourself through the process. Ferguson, what? 65% African American? One city council person, one female sister there? 50 some odd police officers and only three, three African American police officers? Obvious. You need to get those brothers and sisters in that community organized to take over the city council seats, the majority of the seats. And you want progressive, dedicated type politicians. That's the way you're going to change that police, that, that police department. I put community control of police. We, the Black Panther Party, brothers and sisters, put an example of community control of police on the ballot in Berkeley, California. 
We only lost by one percentage point. What is community control of police as we designed it then? We would have three duly elected commissioners. We would not have the mayor just appoint a police chief. You see what I'm getting at? We want to duly elect some police commissioners from our community. And yeah, we'll find qualified ones, but we want some progressive kind of people. You know? And two, we want police community review boards duly elected from the people. The community control, meaning people's control, meaning people's choices. You see what I'm getting at? And have a community police review board. Odd number of five, five, seven, nine, ten, nine or eleven. And each board with teeth, with investigative teeth. Yeah, you got in Oakland, California, like you got the little so-called police review board. They have no teeth, no investigative powers, nothing. And that's that front, you know what I mean? The mayor, well, we got a police review board. Uh, talk to them, and they just say, okay, we looked at it, and we can't find anything. I said, that, that's not a police review board. You see that? They let them guys go and garner. And this is an illegal chokehold in New York. They let them go. What's your name? I shot that boy and shot Michael in the back first. And he turned around, why are, you sh why are you shooting at me? And he continued to blow him away. And the little DA says, well, we're not going to indict him. Oh, the DA depends on the police department for all of his other problems and is going against the police department. Man, are you kidding? Yeah, we got a lot of cops out there just do their jobs. So we'll respect those. But the ones that, that violate the line and blow us away because they are uh, overshooters, and we got to deal with that. And the only real way, that, the primary way to deal with it, I won't say use the word only, that's too absolute. The primary way to deal with it is in especially towns like Ferguson, et cetera, boom, 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 where you got minority peoples, whether they're Chicano brothers and sisters or black and those working together, and progressive whites. I need progressive white folks. Lots of them, and there's lots of them you're around. You know, and I'm not talking about some, uh, I, I'm talking about your ideas and your understanding corresponding correctly to reality. That's what it's about. We're struggling for a future world, a present to future world of greater cooperational humanism. We're almost seven billion living human beings on the face of this earth. When I started the Black Panther Party, it was just near five billion. It is now seven. Billion! I mean, I know people don't like to deal in those kind of numbers, but I have no problem dealing with the numbers because I can imagine, I can see, I can know. This our little earth and our little environment, our little need for ecological environment to solve this problem and the police killings. We need to take over more political power seats, city council seats, et cetera. And I need young brothers and sisters who are progressive. You know, ain't no whole lot of pay, but if you want to deal with this, deal with it. And if you do get a little money on the side where you can survive, run for some of these political offices and deal with this stuff and stop worrying about whether or not you're going to lose the election just because some right winger is going to talk about, talk about that. Get out there and deal with it and, and do legislation, make legislation and policy that make human sense. That's what this struggle is all about. That's what my struggle was about. That's what it continues to be about. When I say all power to the people, I mean that. Yes, and our African, African and African American brothers and sisters, we organize and we struggle and we did our little part Chicano brothers and sisters and Mexican American brothers and sisters have organized and now they're trying to do their part and we're aiding and putting that together. So I want to see black and brown dominate progressively. I don't want to see them dominate for some dictator crap. I ain't gonna go for that. And I want to see them dominate with progressive policies and relevant programs. That's what this struggle is about. That's what my struggle was about. And the reason I created the Black Panther Party, this African and African American History Month, maybe you can see it in the method I was using. I mean, Richard M. Nixon, as I said, just after he was sworn in, told J. Edgar Hoover he wanted us to get rid of the Black Panthers. And right after that shootout at 41st and Central, 
young white policemen, young white policemen, I bless his underground spirit soul. He stole the FBI's plans to shoot, kill, and murder Black Panther Party members at Central Headquarters and gave the plans to our lawyers. We put that shit on the front page. And that young white mayor with his little progressive ass, I love him. He up in Seattle, Washington. He says, we're not going to have the FBI coming in here. You're not going to use our police department to attack the Black Panthers in our community. The Black Panthers have breakfast programs. They have food programs. They have clinic programs. They even have a young hospice program here. And, there, and we're not going to have them. We want the FBI out of here. Right on, Mayor. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the thing to do. Do the right thing. You see, that's the kind of shit we want. And whether you're black, white, blue, red, green, yellow, polka dot, you got to be progressive like that. Don't be running around here. I hope ain't nobody praising Clarence Thomas. Two thumbs down on Clarence Thomas. Got no time for that boy. You <laughs> know what I mean? <laughs> See, so I, if you, if you, if, 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 that's where it's at. All right, you guys, look, I've been trying to do a film. It's my life story. Probably I'm gonna wind up doing three different films. And uh, this is not a documentary. Mine's is a dry, righteous drama. Now I'll try to work with some of these other guys who are trying to do their films, but they gotta be fair with me. You know what I mean? Uh, me, uh, I wish, I'm hoping to do these films and make a little money off of it. Uh, I'm trying to raise an extra $500,000 for my nonprofit entity, besides what my family needs and stuff like that to live and survive, I need a half a million dollars out of my film productions and anything and everything I do. I'm trying to set up my environmental renovation youth jobs projects. You notice what I talked about in the beginning of this session. I talked about real, realistic community programs. That's why I started out. Years after the Black Panther Party was over, I ran youth jobs programs in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Raised money for them, et cetera. Got these young brothers jobs, et cetera. Trained them on these jobs and educated them. Uh, at the same time, they were on these jobs and made sure that they made up their minds to go to college. Because we need information, we need young politicians and stuff like this here. And, and young engineers and young scientists who are there and dedicated. And you're not just tripping. You run around here tripping on some stuff, you know what I mean? I, I don't relate to all this, 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 this terrorist groups running around indiscriminately killing people. I ain't gonna support none of them. If I support them, I just as soon supported the Ku Klux Klan and all the indiscriminate killing they did to us. I just as soon supported Timothy McVeigh, who blew up that damn Oklahoma building with his racist ass. You see what I'm getting at? I don't support none. I don't give a damn what color they are. If you run around indiscriminately killing people, that, that, that has, you, you, what you think, you, you think you're standing for some kind of liberation? No. If you're running around indiscriminately killing and murdering people like that, and I don't get, even, yes, I considered a uh, 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 Bush, an uh, overt uh, 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 terrorist, a terrorist himself, just like fellow, have fellow Bonsi said. So I don't support him and none of that. I support people's rights. I support constitutional, democratic, civil, human rights for all people. Every right that I stand up for and every right that we can get a progressive legislature to hold up and stuff up, it means that all the people got them rights, whether you're black, white, blue, red, green, yellow, or polka dot. We're six billion strong. And we have to get a balanced ecology. And this is the biggest threat. This is the biggest threat to the avaricious corporate money rich. The biggest industry in the world is the oil industry. Understand that. And we have to evolve alternative energy sources rapidly. I mean, just a few years, you may have not seen the significance of it. A few years ago, there was a thing on the ballot that the corporate money rich who control all the energy frameworks did not want to allow local communities to develop their own alternative energy sources like wind power. 
You see what I mean? Like solar power, et cetera, and so on. Didn't want them to do that. One little town off of New England there put together, I don't know, what was it? 50,000, 60,000 population town. They put their own money together and built their own single, single wind power windmill to generate all the electricity for all the houses in their little town. That's called community control. That, you see, that's policies and stuff that made them have that right. And so they don't have to be paying no exorbitant ass prices, <laughs> you know, to some utility companies and stuff. You see what I mean? And this is the kind of stuff that's got to proliferate all kind of current culture. And there's different forms and kinds of alternative energy sources, et cetera, for different reasons, et cetera. This has got to happen. And you're going to have a, this is, a, this is, this is, this encompasses all the other revolutionary problems of revolution. When I say revolution, I'm not talking about guns and shooting. Revolution is not about a need for guns or violence. It's not about that. Revolution is about a need to re-evolve more political, economic, and social justice empowerment back into the hands of the people. That's the revolution. You see what I mean? If you can do it peacefully, yes. If you're not going to do it peacefully, that means they're contacting you, so you have to defend yourself so you can get back to a nonviolent situation and get the legislation and put it in where it makes human sense. That's what the struggle is about. So never discount peaceful protest. It is very important. But always remember, if you're pushed in the corner, hopefully die true. I'm not talking about tripping. Pushed in the corner, you know, it's... It, you have to defend yourself, and I still stand on that ground. Power to the people, thank you very much. Uh, those of you, I want to let you ask a couple of questions, but I would like for you to look at some of the books I have, et cetera, to support us in my films and other things we do. Uh, they're back there. The art book is really a, a piece. I, I was only able to bring six or seven of those books with us today. Seize the Time is the book I wrote when I was a political prisoner for two years. I wrote it in jail, largely. And then there's a couple of some historical posters of me when I went to the California State Legislature, May 2nd, 1967. Remember, we were a ragtag organization at that time. But when I went to the California State Legislature, the Black Panther Party received international notoriety. Can you imagine that? We got international notoriety, and I had less than 50 people in my organization at the time. And uh, that poster back there, you see me in it, and et cetera. But anyway, can I... Uh, Hello, hello, hello. Okay. To so ask, a, ask a few questions, not a whole lot, but go so, ahead. So anybody who has a question, if I can have you guys come yeah, up. Yeah, raise your hand and come right over here. And you guys can go ahead and ask your questions into the mic. So does anybody have any questions? Some guy had his hand up back there a while on, back. Come Where on, come on up, come on up. Line up. Um, okay. Hi, my name is Marley. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of the Pan-African Film Festival that they hold um, on February, but they have a Black Panther women's movie there about like Black Panther women in Australia. And um, I wanted to know if you knew anything about that movement. No, I don't know anything about the film. Is the film you were talking about? Yeah, and it's about um, this woman named Marlene Cum um, yeah, Cummings. I, I, I'm sorry. I, 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 I happen not to know. If somebody needs to email me. And let me know, because I do get up and answer my email every morning if I get a chance to be home. Okay. Uh, I, I, I just don't know. Uh, what, next question. Just appreciate everything that you've done for the struggle, what have you, it's an honor being here, uh, seeing you speak. Uh, do you have any updates on Asada by any chance? Shakura, no, I'm just hoping that um, the sister uh, gets uh, pardoned. I'm hoping that uh, Obama, in building this new relations with Cuba, says she's pardoned. 
I'm hoping Obama, by the time he leaves office, I still have 12 political prisoners, Black Panther Party members, and uh, we have been sending the names in to our two African-American Black Panther congressmen who are United States congressmen. Is there anything that we can do? Can we write our local congressmen? Yeah, well, what we need to do is get all information on all political prisoners, et cetera, what have you. And uh, the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, I don't know if Maxine Waters, he should be connected with it too, is getting all information concerning political prisoners, et cetera, to them, concerning them. Uh, the main thing is getting that gun, and I was trying to raise money so that they could be put on the Innocence Project. The Innocence Project right. is a thing, broad thing. So by the time it comes to part, we have good information, because most of my brothers and our brothers and sisters in the Black Panther Party who became political prisoners, who were still political prisoners, came in that COINTELPRO period when they were attacking all the Black Panther Party members. You see, that's where they are. Now, of course, we got Geronimo out, you know. I mean, I, I, we worked on that some years ago when, when I did an interrogatory in the Geronimo's behalf some 14, 15 years ago, which caused, it helped him get out, you know. And then we got Michael McGee out just recently in, in Maryland. You know, he did 43 years, you know, for something he didn't do, all with the COINTELPRO. So that's what we're going to hope for, that we can get all these brothers and sisters pardoned, you know what I mean, out of that. Thank you. All right. Hello, uh, my name is Nick. I'm with the Pasadena Independent. Hello, can you hear me? No? Is, is yeah. the Independent a news article? Yeah, it's a, it's a oh. newspaper, but this question is um, okay. from Mr. Ralph Walker of uh, Monrovia. He's a guy I interviewed. Um, he wishes he could have been here tonight. He was one of those kids selling newspapers in Chicago in 1969. Black Panther Party newspapers? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and he was said he was friends with uh, Fred Hampton, who he said was the baddest panther to ever walk the land. Um, and his question, he's, he wanted to um, ask on behalf of me, I guess, was uh, it's in regards to young people today. And he says, is there a need for a new Black Panther Party? The, the existing new Black Panther Party, listen to me, y'all, every last one of you. Thumbs down. The group now that's calling themselves the new Black Panthers, zip. They, Everything I talked about here to, to you tonight, their rhetoric is totally antithetical to what we stood for and what we were about. They are confusing our African and African American history of what my Black Panther Party was about. Now, I appeal to them. We've had those guys at some of our reunions. They insulted us, et cetera, cutting my head off. That famous picture of me and Huey standing in front of the office, cutting my head up and putting Khalid's head up there. And all. that, 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 that's it. And, 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 and then going to be arrogant about it. So we told them to get out. Don't come to our reunions anymore. We was trying to educate you about what we were about, you know. So I have nothing to do with them as a new Black Panthers. You see what I mean? And you don't have to have an organization named the Black Panther Party to do the positive, progressive things I'm talking about. There's all kind of organizational groups. They are progressive. You have to see how progressive an organizational group of people are and what they're about in terms of what, and what they're organizing around. You know what I mean? And if it's really, truly leading to not only uh, more political progressive seats, but policies and legislation that make human sense. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, my question has to deal with uh, drugs in the party or drugs in the movement. Uh, there's been a lot of stories circulating about uh, drugs in the Panthers and especially drugs related to Huey. Well, Huey, Huey died a drug addict. Right. Uh, he became a drug addict. Now, he wasn't a drug addict in the early days that I talked about. Uh, I, I, any, anything that Huey may have been doing, trying to do illegal, et cetera, I talked him out of it in the early days. And I told him, you, you, you don't do any shit, illegal shit around me because I won't, I won't work with you, et cetera. Is this but after Huey, he came wait out of minute. prison? Huh? Is this after he came out of prison? or? No, brother, this huh? is in the beginning, man. Hmm? Again, I just told you about the beginning days before Huey went to prison. And Huey did the right thing. His latter days, that last year, he died, he died a drug addict. I mean, he abused drugs on his own person. 
He did it. And I just found out that several years ago that Huey was bipolar. And taking those drugs, he did crazy dumb stuff. Wait, wait a minute, brother. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. And uh, I'm just saying that happened. Now, then there's, there was a TV One movie I heard that's out. What would they, they, tab, they put in a movie called Celebrity Criminals? Yeah, it was a TV One movie back here a month or two ago. And it was talking about Bobby Seale and Huey Newton. We were both celebrity criminals. This is what they were saying. I won my case in uh, Connecticut. I won my case at the Great Chicago Seven Conspiracy Trial. The only thing I was convicted of was disturbing the peace of the California State Legislature May 2nd, 1967. And that was a misdemeanor, a six month thing. I couldn't get no more than six months in jail, but that's a misdemeanor, blah, 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 blah. You know, and then they say that, I think they said that uh, Huey Newton's goon squad beat up Bobby Seale, not true. Never happened. If anybody had to beat me up, they have a problem. Big problem with me. You know what I mean? I mean, uh, when I said I'm an expert shot, I was an expert shot, baby, when I was 12 years old. And, and after that, I trained, I taught Huey and them about the guns. I told them, me, Richard Ioki, and big man Albert Howard, we were ex-military personnel, and we trained these brothers. Now, Huey, I give him credit for everything he helped contribute. You know, it's just that he fell apart in the tail end in real life. You know, the tail end when I resigned from the Black Panther Party. Next question, please. I like your answers. Uh, my first question, I have two questions, if you don't mind. The first question is, um, it takes a lot for people to invest um, in the opportunities that people like you present. Uh, and especially put their lives on the line. I respect what you've done. How did you get people on board with that level of commitment? And then, um, I know that you guys did a lot of things, like you became international with less than 50 people, which is unheard of. So f first question is, how did you get them on board? And then how did you establish enough credit? You mean how did I get the first 50 people? Well, how did you get people to put that level of commitment in, I mean, people are putting their lives in line. How did the power structure get them to do it? Listen to me. This is what I said earlier. Prior to Dr. Martin Luther King being killed, I only had 50 members, uh, three or 400 members up and down the West Coast. All right, Seattle, Portland, Sacramento, San Francisco, Oakland Bay Area, Los Angeles, and San Diego. When they killed Dr. Martin Luther King, brother, this was the thing. Young brothers and sisters flooded my organization. They killed him April the 4th, 1968. By November, when Nixon was elected, I had 5,000 members and 49 chapters and branches all across the United States of America. And they were angry that Dr. King was killed and murdered. And they joined the Black Panther Party. How do I get them to commit? political education classes, going there and going to those chapters and going to those branches and stuff and teaching them the fine particulars and the methodology of grassroots community organizing, the same stuff I've been trying to tell you we did. And young brothers got into what I was talking about. We need programs. I want programs. And the more programs you get, the more people you're going to get registered to vote around those programs in those districts. All these brothers and sisters live in some kind of voting precinct and they can get unified, et cetera, and understand quantitative increase, quantitative decrease causes a qualitative leap of change. So the increased amount of times that you get brothers and sisters in the community working, so people get committed to that kind of work and understand it and understand the goal objectives. You see, of wanting to get people politically elected who are going to change the racist laws, you see what I mean, et cetera, and so on. That's why they get committed. You see what I mean? And then and, and they got committed because of circumstances out there. Dr. Martin Luther King was murdered. They flooded my organization. I mean, in a matter of five or six months, I moved from 400 members to 5,000 members in 49 chapters and branches throughout the United States of America. That's 49 cities and voting precincts. You see what I'm getting at? So you, you, you got to see that visual thing that people can get a hold to. And at those times, these times here are very, very different. See, 
You had a nationwide anti-war protest movement, a nationwide civil, ongoing civil rights movement, and we, the Black Panther Party members in the middle of the 1960s, popped up right in the middle of it and joined that civil human rights protest movement. Next question, please. One more question, if that's okay. Um, last question. What are some of the obstacles that hit you, uh, that were unexpected, that hit you and Huey, where it was such, the blow was so devastating, you felt like you might not be able to get past it, and then how did you, what were your tools? Well, to, if, to if, 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 I mean, see, you're assuming that I, I must have been in a situation where I, felt I may not get past it, okay? <laughs> they put me on death row. Right. They put Huey on death row. Right. You see what I mean? And when we went into this thing, we knew that there's a great possibility that we would get killed, et cetera, and so on. We knew that that's a great possibility, all right? Huey did get shot, and we had very few or no members when Huey was shot, all right? Huey was arrested in the hospital where he was shot in the side. Officer Fry was dead, and Officer Haynes was wounded back down in West Oakland. But my point is, bang, so he was in jail. So Huey was not there to organize the party with me. I organized this Black Panther Party all across the country. Fred Hampton helped me organize the Black Panther Party. Eldridge Cleaver and Kathleen Cleaver helped me organize the Black Panther Party. Sister Archie Jones, the Boston, Massachusetts chapter, helped me organize the Black Panther Party. You know, another sister out of the, out of the Illinois State chapter on the Central Committee that the leadership body of the Black Panther Party. She, these, these brothers and sisters work with me and we work together, you know what I mean? And then we won that last shootout. You have to understand that. That L.A. shootout, in effect, we won that. Because even after they arrested the brothers, let the brothers take the arrest and not shoot them, then we went to preliminary hearing in the courtroom. We won in the courtroom. The judge told the police you had no business down there attacking the Black Panther Party that first person in the first damn place. That, that, that you happen to have one of those progressive liberal judges who understood the difference, you know. Well, we thought they, they, they looked, appeared to have automatic weapons. They were AR-16, they were semi-automatic. Well, that gives us reasonable cause. No, it doesn't, said the judge. On the outskirts of Los Angeles here in the woods is a Ku Klux Klan, and they got the same kind of semi-automatic weapon. How come you ain't out there arresting them? And the judge threw the shit out of court. We won that shit. We won 95% of all our courtroom cases in this country. So we fought. I fought in that courtroom for seven weeks, and he finally changed shackle and gagged me. But in the courts, I won. I won the Connecticut case. I won that, and they had to let me out of jail. So you got obstacles, and you there, and you dedicated. You see? But it ain't well, oh, I ain't got time for that. You know, I ain't got time for that, you know what I mean? I had one brother, he flaked out. He said, I said, well, George. And he says, Bobby, I says, okay, no big thing. You know, George went on to be a preacher, which is fine. But I'm just saying, you got obstacles, you know? Next question, please. Thank you. Yeah. Bobby, uh, <clears throat> I was a young boy and I saw you on the world news. As a matter of fact, I was a shoeshine boy in a, in a Jewish country club, and I saw on the world news where they had you bound and gagged in the courtroom, and all these white men were standing around telling me how they, need, they you needed your ass beat, and how they should just literally, in these words, fuck you up in the courtroom. And Who was saying all this? Some location where you was at? I was in a Jewish country club. Oh, a Jewish country club. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, and I was a shoe shine boy. Yeah. And it came on TV, and I, and they showed you on the world news where you were bound and gagged in the courtroom, and they were saying all this foul shit, and I, I didn't know how to speak up and address it. Mm -hmm. But that moment in time taught me that I would never be afraid to address a situation where a brother's in a bag situation because it affected me in a way where I, I wanted to defend you but I didn't know how 
But then I started reading you guys' works, like you and George Jackson. Okay, give me your question, brother. Well, I'm sorry. But thank you, thank the you. The question though. is, do you think the, the poweronomics move that black people are talking about making today is the correct path to go as far as the, 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 the practicing what? black economics? You, you know. gotta have you gotta you gotta have economics. You can have black economics in the black community if you want to, but 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 what am I trying to say here? Jerry Rubin was a Jewish boy, and he jumped up in the middle of the courtroom and jumped in between the guards who was beating me up in that chair. Abby Hoffman was a Jewish boy, and he jumped up. Bill Kunstler was a Jewish boy, and he jumped up. So while you got one group to saying one thing, I got a whole other group okay, of I, Jewish, I, I Jewish boys, kids, every families that I know all across America that got out there in the middle of the streets with me and got their ass beat, some of them, et cetera, and brutalized, protesting with us in opposition to the racist power structure. So I'm just saying I know the difference between my friends and enemies in one context. So how do you help? You protest. You protest. You go to the rallies, et cetera, boom, boom, boom. Back in those days, brothers would go, you, we, we go, go down to the Black Panther Party. Boom, you're going to be selling the paper with me stating, my, and state, and stating on the front of the paper my, my, my reasons why I'm standing up. And so they, so they gagged me for three or four days. Three days. No, that's what they did. Well, what about the black leadership of the day? It seems so kind of suspect. Well, well what, what is your black leadership? Your best black leadership that you've got now is Maxine Waters, Barbara Lee, Bobby Rush. Barbara Lee and Bobby Rush are former Black Panther Party members. They deal in all kinds of progressive legislation, right on down to Bush when he started that war in Afghanistan. Barbara Lee, former Black Panther Party organizer, was the only one who's a United States congressman that voted against Bush's goddamn war. And, then, and, and, and I'm just saying that's what happened. And so we got people all over the place that, that, that are just because you don't have some uh, dictatorial leader talking talk, that's one thing. But if you don't have no political power seats, you ain't going to change nothing. You run around here with guns all you want, et cetera, you ain't going to change it. You got to have those political power seats, men, women, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and change the policies, change the racist laws, change the exploitation laws, et cetera. This is what, and that's what the movement and the struggle is about. And just because we don't have some uh, a Malcolm X and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. See, one thing, yeah, I became well-known, and I'm a good speaker, and I'm an inspirational speaker, et cetera. But I didn't just sit around and talk and wonder and hope as a leader. I got out there and did real organizing with the people. See what I'm getting at? And we stood and we defended ourselves, and we organized and defended ourselves when we were attacked. Next question, please. Uh, look, I, uh, yeah. we're, gonna try to get, we're gonna try to get one or two more. And just ask one question, please, and a question. Oh, okay. So when you were um, organizing the Black Panther Party, you were a student, and then during that time, many other students were organizing also. And as a student right now, I feel like I'm bombarded with like, lots of ideas about you know, how to achieve liberation and whatnot. So I was wondering how you clarified your own vision of liberation and how you practiced that. Well, like I said in the beginning of the lecture tonight, uh, a guy named Martin Luther King inspired me. And I, next thing I know, a year or so later, I'm out organizing a youth jobs program and teaching the youth in this North Richmond community their African African American history and the, the relevancy of themselves as human beings. That's what I was doing. And that's how I got started. And then the next thing I know, I, I, I'm, 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 I lived across the street from Merritt College. I organized the Black History Fact Group well, 15, 16 brothers and sisters who met at my house across the street from Merritt College. And we got together and we did the research and, and we went to the University of California libraries, all 26 libraries, and we got all this African African American history and we wrote four syllabus, four syllabus for four courses, two courses in African studies and two courses in black American studies. And then did the bibliography 
and then synopsized some story facts, all of us, and then went before Dean Olson and demanded, demanded that we put in the curriculum, black American history in the curriculum because we know that people need to be educated about this. It's not just black folks, other people need to be educated about who we are as human beings and peoples in the face of this earth. So we did that and those are the early days. And then I'm still employed by the city government when I organized the Black Panther Party. I'm still employed by the city government when I led the armed delegation to the California State Legislature. Of course, a month later they fired me, but, <laughs> and I expected that, you know, but that ain't gonna stop nothing, you know what I mean? I was rolling, you know what I mean? I'm on a roll now and boom, 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 and we're not gonna stop. And then the next thing you know, they put me in jail six months, Huey goes to jail, boom, and ain't no organization hardly worth nothing because I'm in jail. And then I get out of jail, Huey's in jail because he's gonna be in there for a long time, but my point is I reorganized and restructured the party. Me and Eldridge Cleaver pulled together, me, Eldridge Cleaver, and Kathleen Cleaver organized the Free Huey Birthday Rally February 17th, and today is February 17th, Huey Newton's birthday. But I'm just saying, we organized that rally, and we put that together, and we packed that auditorium. We packed that auditorium in Oakland, California. And we merged with SNCC. SNCC merged with us. And they became Black Panthers. We didn't come with SNCC people, but they became Black Panthers. Uh, you know, and then that, that, was, that was a great political move. You see what I'm getting at? In terms of unifying protest movement efforts in those very early days in 1960 and 1967. 68. Then they killed Dr. Martin Luther King and people flooded my organization and I had to go around the country. I was really out there teaching these brothers and sisters in every chapter and every branch the fine particulars and the methodology of grassroots programmatic community organizing. And if you have to understand what that entails, because every time I, we wound up with 20 some odd different active programs serving the people in communities all across the United States of America. From legal aid, free pharmacy programs, free preventative medical health care clinics, sickle cell anemia testing programs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We did this, young folks and people got involved and did it and put it together. We moved our circulation of the Black Panther Party newspaper from 5,000 to 400,000 every week on Saturday that newspaper was out there. Young folks did that and organized that and put that together. They wrote that paper, they did the news in that paper. It's a, they, they, they did that I, and, and to me, all these brothers and sisters and people who joined me, I considered them at those times some of the best grassroots programmatic organizers in the world to this day. And that's what we did. Next, please. Good evening, Mr. Seal. Um, within the last year, Asada Shakur um, has been the first woman to be put on the FBI's wanted list for terrorism. I wanted to know your take on that, if any. And then also you said the open relationship with Cuba that America has um, or is trying to open Hopefully up. Hopefully it's going to give her a pardon. Right. I'm do hoping. You, do you think that um, in doing that, America or the United States, actually, I should say, the United States is um, kind of levering that into tra trialing her in, um, uh, in the United States. Lure her. her. Well, opening, not luring her, but um, with the open relationship to Cuba, it'll, um, she'll, I guess they'll have access to her and to try her in the United States versus her oh, in they, Cuba. They, she, she's, oh, I'm, I'm going to say that this. Christie in Jersey, they gonna call for that. They gonna, they gonna call for that. But that ain't the first time they did that. When I was living in Philadelphia 20 odd years ago, who's that other woman's name was uh, governor, governor of Jersey at the time, I forget her name. She called for it. She called for Osada Shakur to be turned over from the Cuban government, boom, boom, boom. And of course I was interviewed and I was all on television saying she represents the long arm of racist fascism in the United States of America trying to jam up this sister, et cetera, boom, boom, boom. And I'm saying that I'm looking forward to, 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 to uh, Obama, hopefully, whether he will or won't, pardoning her. If he pardons her, she's pardoned. They can't do nothing to her. I mean, do you know that about the law? 
That, that's a fact. That's just, we got to look forward to that possibility. You know, and if and if and if they and if, and they think if they think that they're gonna snag her, go 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 go, go to France. Why you say go to France? I got a brother that stayed in France and died there. France will not let you come back if you got a death penalty charge hanging on you. Ah, see, France won't. So I mean, there's all kind of avenues in case things don't happen. You know what I mean, sister? <laughs> yes. Yes, I'm uh, curious on what were your thoughts on uh, Obama's election and if they've changed um, six years later. Well, I, I didn't get your question. You're curious about Obama's election and they changed six years later. I'm curious um, what your no. thoughts. Oh, okay. Really, when he first started out, he had a Democratic Congress on his side for those first two years. That's how they pushed through the, the health program, okay? Then an off-year election came and the Republicans took over the House, okay? This is what happened, all right? And then they blocked everything, everything you try to do. He tried to do certain things. He thought that they would cross over, you know what I mean? But they wouldn't do it. They played with And to this day, these right-wing racist Republicans now, understand something. In this interim, these politicians, the Koch brothers and all the money, Karl Rove and all this stuff, they forced out every moderate Republican. They forced them all out. They totally out of the party. Even Arlen Specter, Arlen Specter was Pennsylvania. He had always been a moderate Republican for all those years. And in his last days, he got forced totally out of the Republican Party. So they're a bunch of right-wing nuts. They're assholes. They don't care. They are working for the avaricious corporate money rich on every level. From the oil industry, which is the largest industry in the world, down. And Obama has did a hell of a job doing stand-up, right on down to the immigration issues, right on down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As president, in the context of this, this is where it ain't nothing but these right-wing racist idiots in the right-wing Republican and the Tea Party. They're, they're working for the avaricious corporate money rich. And if you don't know it, the, 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 the Koch brothers are multi-billionaires and they part and parcel of the largest industry in the world, which is the oil industry, along with Dixie, Dixie plates and Dixie cups. I say, oh, I'm going to oh, boycott Dixie plate and Dixie cups. And I looked at him, I said, God damn, I found out the list of the, of the shit that the, the billionaire Koch brothers own. Shit, man, it's about 190 goddamn items I have to boycott on. <laughs> how, how, how can I boycott the oil industry and I need some gas for my goddamn car, even though it's a gas saver? See what I mean? So it's a, you see what I'm getting at, man? You got to understand the, the, the politics of what's happening today. The lines are drawn in the sand. A lot of people don't see it. Others, oh, the Democrats is this. Yeah, they're asshole Democrats, you know, just as well as they're asshole Republicans. But there are some progressive Democrats and some independents. The independent out of, I love that brother, out of, um, out of Vermont or uh, New Hampshire. What's the sister's name, the, the female that they wanted to run? Elizabeth? Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren and Southern. A lot of, we got to get, and there's a lot more of them out there like that. These are the kind of people that we got to get in there, man. And I like to see more sisters out here running, running for political office and understanding what they're talking about and getting in areas, et cetera. You know what I mean? This, this has got to happen. You know what I mean? You, you can't just sit around, oh, I don't want to hear that. I'm not like that. You know, uh, I was raised a carpenter in the building. And when I became an architectural designer, and draftsman. When I would do layout for adding two rooms, den and an upper bedroom, to the back of houses for my father, you know, when I was 15, 16 years old doing this, you know, and uh, boom. What I learned is the plans that I have and all the spec specifications you know, for materials, what have you, et cetera, for those plans, all the stuff, boom, boom, boom. 
is just plans. It's like a theory. You see what I mean? Now, the thing to do <laughs> is to get out there and build the damn thing. You see what I mean, man? Be get it built. You see? So when I talk about this, you, you, I, I need young brothers and sisters. I'm 70-something years old. I, I got in the struggle at age, what was it, 26, 26, 27, 27 years old. And I'm lucky to even live this long. You see what I'm getting at? Boom. But I, I, I want you to roll. Now, that the billionaire club is the billionaire club. But they got another smaller group of billionaires. They do support the progressive side. You know, and, ben, and Clinton and, and, and you know, she, and whether it's going to get some money from that and run their campaign. It's a contradiction to try to live, survive, or organize in a capitalistic social order with no goddamn capital. It's absurd to try to even do it. Even if you are a diehard socialist or whatever, if you're going to organize, you're going to have to have some capital, etc. It's about where your heart, mind, and soul is at, what you want to use the capital for to organize and do things with. You see, that's where I come from. That's the way I work. That's the way I think. You know, like I say, I want to get a hold of $500,000 so I can set a couple of examples of environmental renovation youth jobs projects. And these are shining examples which means I'm going to go to all these liberals and other whoever, et cetera, to get as much money as we can to proliferate that. And the increased amount of times that we put more and more youth jobs, environmental renovation youth jobs projects together, we're decreasing the apathy. We're decreasing the, the, the possibility of the destruction of our environment, et cetera, and so on. You see what I mean? That, 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 that's the way I think. You know, and, and boom. So I have to go through a lot of processes to get films made, to get people to understand if you're going to make a film of me, then I want some of that money. I got a company here uh, that we can do that. And then, of course, this money is going to go over here for, for the other things I'm doing. You're just not going to exploit me. You see what I'm getting at? You see, I just got out of negotiations with ABC Studios. And they were pissing and whining. Uh, that's too much money. Uh, they don't too much money. Y'all billionaires, you know what I mean? So I had the other people in there on my side, but the little finance department. But you know, that, that's the way that go. Look here, brothers and sisters. I got some books back here. I got some of them autographed. I'll personalize the autograph. Please come back. Thank you very much. Power to the people. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, tomorrow we are having our second What to Watch uh, movie. We're going to be showing 12 Years a Slave in the Wi-Fi Lounge from 3.30. Uh, also, this Thursday, we're going to have our Taste of Soul event, which is the History of Soul Food. We'll be serving full-on, authentic, fresh soul food for you guys. That'll be in the same building, same time, 5.30 to 8. So hopefully I see you guys there.